conference, another regional science conference around the world. Uh, she is based in North America, um, but she's also interested in getting to know a little bit more the European side of the story, if I'm correct, right? You did say something. That's correct, like yes. Uh, do, do you have any origin of Europe or not? Yes, I, um, you can't tell by my American accent, but I actually grew up in Scotland. Um, uh, my father was a fisherman in southwest Scotland. I grew up there and I moved to United States when I was in high school. And when so, she says that, she changes the accent from America. I, got, I, got, I, got, I, I can change, I I can change the accent back and forth. I got the Scottish good... accent. I got it. I was actually telling that. I got the Scottish accent. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I remember some kind of connection with Scotland. But then, you know, she when she normally speaks, she has a, a clear American accent. But I remember that she could actually switch into the Scottish accent, which, by the way, I love. So anyway, so yes. she, she has some European European connection uh, yeah. there. Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, let me tell you what Sarah is going to talk to us today. Basically, the reason why I said that the topic was very interesting was because she's going to talk about entrepreneurship, broadband, and gender. So, you know, I'm very much into, aside from entrepreneurship and broadband, I'm very much into gender issues as well. Uh, I've been called feminist several times, even though I'm not. I'm actually just for equality, you know, so call me whatever you want, but I really am into uh, gender issues. Um, and so I'm very interested in, in what she's going to present to us. Uh, before I introduce Sarah um, uh, and tell you a little bit more about what she does and where she's located, I just have to do a couple of announcements. The first is that we are recording uh, the session. Uh, Sarah has been already told that we would record her and she said she was fine. But uh, um, for the panelists that are in here and also the attendees, if you are actually staying with us and not moving into the uh, YouTube channel, you implicitly are agreeing to being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, you do have to move to the YouTube channel. And uh, because the GSSI has a YouTube channel and it will be um, live streaming uh, this talk. Um, Fabiano Compagnucci, who is an assistant professor here at the GSSI, will be uh, following the YouTube channel and pick up any kind of questions that you might have also from that channel if you feel more comfortable not being part of this uh, uh, Zoom uh, call. So that's just to tidy up a little bit a few things that everybody stays here, <laughs> everybody's happy to be recorded. Uh, right, okay, so let me tell you just very briefly uh, what Sarah is, uh, was, is doing and where she is. So uh, if you were uh, with us a few moments ago, you, you now know that Sarah is uh, uh, Scottish in reality, but she's hiding behind an American accent. <laughs> Uh, she is an associate professor of regional economics, so really my field. Um, and uh, she's the director of the Exceed, and uh, she is in the College of Agricultural, Food and Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. Uh, of course, you can uh, look uh, the research uh, interests of Sarah, but broadly speaking, she has been focusing on things that I'm looking into right now as well, which is basically issues on rural economic uh, development uh, with the focus also on, as you will see today, entrepreneurship, for instance. But I'm very glad to see that she's also moving into a uh, gender issue on top, on top of entrepreneurship issue. And she's also the director of the University of Missouri Extension uh, Regional Economic and Entrepreneurial Development Program. Now, I could actually spend a few uh, a little bit of time in, it, exactly explaining to you what extension mean to a non-American. <laughs> I, <was, laughs> I was wondering if I should do that, yeah. <laughs> but let's say it's kind of, uh, I don't know how we call it in Europe, outreach or, you know, third mission. Yeah, that's how we call it. We third call mission. it like third mission yeah. in, in Europe. So, uh, and it's, it's a big issue in the US as it is, and it's becoming even more so a big issue around, right now in Europe. So Sarah, the rules of the game are um, like this. You have up to one hour to um, uh, 
talk about uh, your paper uh, and then uh, after you finish uh, we will start discussion and we'll see how far we go we normally allocate two hours because sometimes you know the discussion picks up and we are unable to finish it but hopefully we won't take you the whole two hours we will let you go a little bit earlier and <laughs> rather than keeping you uh, two hours but let's see so uh, let, let's say up until around hour five o'clock I don't know what time is it it right now but about an hour for your presentation and then we'll start the discussion and thank you very much for joining us very very happy to have you here today thank you for having me i'm really um, honored to have been invited to participate in your webinar series and, and delighted to be here and um, as alessandra said I'm, I'm trying to you know get better connected with my regional science colleagues in in europe and um, i'll be presenting at ursa I'll, I'll be at virtually of course um, in August. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Um, with that, let me start the screen share and I will get going. Um, Alessandra already gave a, a, a fantastic introduction to me. Um, let me just talk a little bit more about, um, about this extension piece because it is 50% of my position here at University of Missouri. And, and by that extension, what my group Exceed does is we take research-based insights and we kind of distill them down and we target um, the outreach to um, small town mayors, chambers of commerce, um, business owners, primarily in rural areas of the state. Um, Kansas City and St. Louis are both in Missouri. They have professional economic developers, but the, the rural areas of Missouri don't have access to professional planners, professional economic developers. And so that's what my team does with our extension work. Um, you know, I also have a 30% research appointment, but that research and extension, they kind of feed each other. So the extension is nice because I get to hear what's going on on the ground in rural areas, what rural business owners are concerned about. And then I can um, address some of those problems with my, my research uh, appointment. Uh, so here's just a, a little bit more about what I do at Mizzou. And just for fun, that's my dog, Bruce. Uh, when I'm not uh, being an academic or a, a mom, I enjoy dog training. I have two Belgian sheep dogs that I do um, agility and, and obedience and rally and, and different things with. So a little bit more about me. Um, before I was at University of Missouri, I've been here three years. I was with the U.S. Department of Agriculture for 10 years. And in the U.S., the Department of Agriculture includes the rural development mission area. So all of the um, rural or what you might call inner uh, development, economic development, is within the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, while I was there, I also worked um, on President Trump's infrastructure bill and kind of brought my experience in broadband research um, to that um, policymaking process, which was a lot of fun. Before being at USDA, I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City. They used to have a center for the study of rural America, uh, so where we were focused on, on rural non-farm issues. That closed and that kind of led to me moving to USDA. And then here, I just have, um, uh, of course, the Scottish flag. We already talked about uh, my Scottish background. And my, my sister does uh, still live in Scotland. Uh, so I try to get back uh, every other year or so and see her. But um, here's kind of a little map of the Midwest, which uh, I think a lot of you are not familiar with the middle of the US. And, and here's Missouri, University of Missouri. And um, here are where I got my degrees. So I did my PhD at University of Illinois. And I think a lot of you as, as regional scientists are familiar with um, real uh, uh, at University of Illinois. So that's where I, I did my PhD. Enough about that. Let's get on with the paper. Great. So this slide is the paper in a nutshell, entrepreneurship, broadband, and gender. And we're gonna look at those three using evidence from rural establishment births or startups in rural areas. Rural areas are in the US are struggling economically and demographically, right? They're aging, younger people are leaving, the economy is tightening. The lack of broadband really amplifies these challenges. 
Um, and rural business owners are especially challenged. There have been a lot of policy initiatives in the past uh, approximately 12 years in the US to help grow broadband. This kind of started after the Great Recession. So 2007, 2009, there was a lot of money for broadband rolling out. Um, but despite um, about $8 billion for broadband in 2009, rural areas are really still lagging in both broadband infrastructure access, but another problem is the adoption. So what we're also finding is when rural areas do get access to broadband, people are not subscribing. And we're not gonna see these economic benefits from broadband until adoption is higher. Um, so I think this study is particularly interesting um, in an academic context because we find that broadband access does enhance rural entrepreneurial outcomes as measured with startups or births. Um, but uh, what is especially unique about this study is that we find broadband has a larger role in remote rural counties and the smallest businesses um, that we call non-employer businesses. And also, um, I think of particular interest during COVID, female-led businesses, right? So um, in the US, we've had massive amounts of women drop out of the labor force uh, over the last year as schools, daycares have closed, um, female-oriented um, occupations like healthcare have been hit really hard. And so I think this study is uh, a good timing because there's a lot of interest from women in potentially smart starting a business. Um, and maybe they're not all gonna be big businesses. Maybe they just wanna have a home-based business, um, but some of those home-based businesses will grow. Other home-based businesses will provide flexibility and income for a family. So what really sets this that study apart is um, our unique findings on the remote rural and the female-led businesses. In the US, it's very difficult to find data um, on gender at the micro level. So we do actually have firm level data that identifies if a, a firm is female led or female owned. Um, and so that's what we are able to use in this data. Uh, before I really get going, I really wanna acknowledge my co-author, Tessa Conroy, there she is. She is a assistant professor at University of Wisconsin in Madison. And um, she's a great co-author. This paper was just recently accepted by International Regional Science Review. Um, and here's a picture of Tessa and I doing extension. So Tessa has an 80% extension appointment. And so this is an example of kind of what extension is during COVID, of course, right? So here we have uh, Tessa, me, and one of my students on Zoom. And we are teaching a day-long workshop to high school students on um, entrepreneurial ecosystems and how to build entrepreneurial ecosystems in their community. Um, I don't know how, you know, how many people are familiar with entrepreneurial ecosystems, but it's, um, and we'll get to it more in the paper, but essentially building a culture that's accepting of risk-taking, um, encourages innovation, um, has access to markets, access to broadband, access to financial capital, access to the resources necessary, to help entrepreneurs prosper. So this is part of our extension program is helping young people, is helping business leaders understand how to build a culture that is um, encouraging of entrepreneurship in their community. All right, let me get back to, back to the paper. Um, here's, a, we're gonna have a very traditional outline for today's um, talk, motivation, um, our, our theoretical model, our empirical model, and results, and I'll and I'll break down the results kind of into some bite-sized policy implication nuggets that are suitable for extension, which hopefully will be um, more interpretable for for all of you. So let me get started with the motivation and why we're doing this research. As I mentioned, I've been doing research on rural broadband for over 15 years, and and I think that rural broadband is um, especially important for rural economic development because online marketplaces really represent an opportunity for rural entrepreneurs to tap larger markets, so higher quantities sold. The internet is also an opportunity for rural entrepreneurs to lower their costs by reducing marketing costs, reducing labor costs for retailing. Um, when I was at USDA, I did a lot of work on local foods. 
and recently have published some work on online sales of local foods, which grew tremendously in the U.S. during COVID. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of neat things about the importance of broadband. This map that I'm showing here, the lightest colors are below the U.S. average. The darkest is one standard deviation above the U.S. average. So what this map shows is that the rural areas, which tend to be the lighter colored areas, okay, have um, fewer websites per business than in the urban areas. So, so here's Chicago, here I am in Missouri. And so we see St. Louis, Kansas City, and this is Lake of the Ozarks. I don't know if anyone's heard of Lake of the Ozarks, but big tourist areas. So we found with, with these data that, you know, really the only rural areas that had a lot of businesses online were, were in tourism areas. So that's a, a little bit of the motivation. I just think that getting online and having access to, um, to thick markets in urban areas is so important um, for rural people. Okay, let me start with the literature kind of broadly looking at rural broadband and economic outcomes. I alluded to this earlier, but in urban areas and in a lot of the typical mainstream entrepreneurship literature, you know, entrepreneurship is equated with growth. This relationship is undoubtedly weaker in rural areas. Instead, in rural areas and through my extension work, entrepreneurship is often equated with quality of life, okay? It allows um, rural people to stay in a region where they grew up and not have to move to Chicago or Kansas City, right? Um, it's also equated with flexibility. If you're farming, um, you want a job that you can maybe do in the winter, but you can get into the field, you know, during the summer. So that flexibility, um, an income source for a family, quality of life, are real drivers for entrepreneurship in rural areas, but, but we don't see as much of that in the literature. So there is a growing body of literature that suggests broadband is linked to jobs and income growth. However, these broadband benefits can go in both directions. And I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on negative impacts of broadband in this paper, because it's just really difficult to tease out these relationships. But I did wanna mention, you know, despite the um, broadband benefits for rural businesses, such as um, reducing remoteness barriers, allowing access to thicker markets, um, payroll growth. Uh, there are negative impacts, such as shifting spending away from rural main streets. So in the US, um, a lot of our towns were developed before automobile. And so there are quaint kind of, you know, we call them brick and mortar, but oftentimes quaint condensed um, downtowns. And so um, those downtowns are dependent on local spending. If more people go online, that can be uh, reduced. And um, I think research is just really getting into thinking about some of the environmental impacts of, of you know, businesses being online, such as more truck deliveries, um, more packaging. Okay, so, so that's a growing area of, um, of, of research. But in essence, there's enough research out there in favor of broadband being linked with what we call um, in the U.S. rural prosperity. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture is really into growing rural prosperity, which is, is kind of their tagline for rural economic growth and, and community development and well-being. So there have been massive investments in broadband by USDA um, due to some of this research. And recently, there's been more cooperation between USDA and what we call our Federal Communication Commission, which are actually the people charged with, with broadband. So increasing cooperation um, between the rural and, and the communication. Okay, honing down a little bit on the literature, let's look at the literature specifically on rural entrepreneurship and broadband. So there have been several studies that have found positive relationships between, you know, elements of this so-called entrepreneurial ecosystem, like all the things that go into making an area entrepreneurial. Um, so some work I did in 2005 with Jason Henderson and Stefan Weiler, uh, Peter Stenberg et al. in 2009, um, Autrech et al. in 2015. So there's quite a few studies out there finding this correlation. Um, causality has been a little bit more difficult to pin down. So there are some more recent studies that are better addressing the causality issue between broadband and entrepreneurship, which I'm sure you can imagine 
um, is, is difficult to tease out. Uh, these studies, however, um, do have of limitations. So this uh, Kim and Erasm paper is a very nice paper that uses difference and difference, um, but it's limited to two states, Iowa and North Carolina. Um, so it's, it's not, maybe not representative of the entire US. Um, other studies like Elizabeth Mack's study, uh, Ivan Kondolov et al's study are limited to particular industrial sectors. So one contribution of this paper is we have access to um, this fantastic firm level proprietary data for the entire US, okay? Um, and that allows us to consider heterogeneity amongst entrepreneurs because we have this gender information, we have the size of the, the business when it starts up that you don't normally get with um, county level data. So in the US, most of our data is available at the county level, which is equivalent to NUTS 3 uh, for you. So what we actually do with our firm level data is we're going to aggregate it up at the county level, but we, we do have that, that female variable because we've got the firm level data um, that you can't normally get with the county level data. So our study is going to address causality. We're going to focus on what we call in the U.S. non-metropolitan counties. So those are counties that are not included in the greater metro area for say Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago. Um, and we're gonna look at our results across a couple different dimensions. We're gonna look at, at all rural, I'm gonna use rural and non-metro interchangeably today. We're gonna look at all rural startups. We're gonna look at the smallest, the non-employer rural startups. So we've got two size classes. And we've also got um, this women-led class. So we're gonna parse our results um, by these different sectors. Let me dive in a little bit on, on the, the women-led businesses and why we, Tessa and I were particularly interested in them. Uh, 1997 to 2007, a period of growth in the US, women-led businesses added um, a half million jobs to the economy, whereas male and co-ed-led businesses lost jobs on net. So very interesting, not something that the US Small Business Administration generally acknowledges. This report caused a lot of uh, kerfuffle stirring. Um, additionally, um, Steve Deller et al. found that US counties with more women-owned businesses were more resilient during the Great Recession, okay? So that 2007 to 2009 period, okay? So two reasons why we should maybe be paying more attention to women-led businesses. They're potentially growing more, they're potentially more resilient, both of which are really needed in rural areas. On the other hand, women-led businesses tend to have lower sales, they tend to employ fewer people, um, they tend to be more home-based businesses, they're often secondary to their partner's um, job or their partner's position. So, you know, if there are higher demands for childcare, say when daycare and school have closed, um, the women-led businesses are more likely to contract, okay? Because these women um, have, are putting the priority on children. And so there's, you know, Tessa has a really nice study in, uh, re really nice paper in regional si studies that looks at um, the presence of young children and how that uh, motivates uh, women entrepreneurs. Putting all this literature together, we think that women-led businesses may be more sensitive to broadband than, than all firms. Okay, so this research is informed by a theoretical framework um, of firm level profits. So pretty plain vanilla, um, nothing really super special on the theoretical model. And, um, you know, we, we can walk through it here. I may go a little bit fast because there's not a whole lot of innovation. The innovation to the theoretical model is we're augmenting it to consider how firms are um, affected by broadband, okay? So um, this, uh, this model is gonna assume uh, infinite number of regions, uh, each region G and individual I is the owner of a firm that enters um, when the, the profit function is, is non-negative or positive. So we've got just kind of a plain vanilla profit function that you're used to seeing um, right there based, based on um, price and quantity, of course. Uh, now, we assume that the quantity sold is a function of business skill, K, 
uh, the skill of the owner and broadband availability B. Okay, so we've got quantity being a function of business acumen or business skill and also broadband in the region. So we're, we're kind of putting forth that a, an individual with access to high speed internet or broadband is going to sell a larger quantity of goods. Uh, earlier, I mentioned, you know, access to online sales could inc increase the quantity um, through uh, online fat platforms, um, higher sales, access to uh, thicker markets with frankly richer um, consumers in urban areas. Okay. Um, so we assume that Q is increasing in broadband availability and owner skill. Um, so that leads us to um, uh, total costs uh, down here. Again, pretty plain vanilla, um, assuming that fixed costs are a function of the owner skill K. Um, and we also, of course, have our labor and our financial capital um, components. Now, uh, what's interesting here is that um, X is an arbitrary scalar, um, an alpha right here, alpha, is a function of access to broadband, B, but also the local entrepreneurial ecosystem defined broadly. Okay, so there's a massive literature out there on what on earth is an entrepreneurial ecosystem, but what we're going to say, you know, essentially this is a function of broadband and um, the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? And so, so there we have um, alpha as a function of the entrepreneurial ecosystem and broadband. Um, and when E approaches one, when the entrepreneurial ecosystem approaches one, then the region is more supportive of entrepreneurship. It's more supportive of innovation, risk-taking. On the other hand, as E approaches zero, the, the region is, is weak in their entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, entrepreneurship is discouraged. Uh, Risk-taking is discouraged in, in that particular region. And so there are a lot of cultural components to this entrepreneurial ecosystem, not just the availability of you know, financial capital and access to markets and, and some of the more components of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Okay, um, last slide on the theoretical framework. Um, you know, we've got this conducive entrepreneurial um, ecosystem here, and um, we're assuming that broadband will lower, also lower costs um, through access to larger and more competitive um, network of suppliers. Um, as well as a knowledge application of alternative um, and more efficient business models. So, so we're assuming broadband uh, may increase the quantity, but may also decrease the cost. Uh, now, in communities with a weak entrepreneurial context or a weak entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, higher levels of broadband may have a, a muted effect on fixed costs, okay? So um, this leads us to our profit function, just um, you know, basically putting all of that together. Um, and then essentially we're assuming that an individual's skill, that K combined with E, that entrepreneurial ecosystem, are both fixed. So if we assume those are both fixed, which seems like a reasonable assumption, then change in profits are dependent upon um, change in access to broadband, okay? And so that, um, that leads us uh, to our um, theoretical model here. So the effects of broadband on firm are expected to be positive via lower costs and higher um, sold. Uh, thus, we expect broadband availability to have a positive impact on prof profits via lower costs and a higher quantity sold. Um, and that those kind of combined with the literature, the theoretical model and the literature together, bring us to our hypotheses, which essentially are that broadband um, internet is um, gonna correspond with establishment births or, or startups, okay? And I mentioned we were carving out kind of two different sets, um, you know, rather than lumping all startups together, like most of the, the studies in this literature do, we're carving out um, two different types of business size. So startups with no wage and salary employees, we call those um, non-employer establishments in the US, okay? And um, then we're gonna conversely look at startups that also have wage and salary employees. So in addition to the entrepreneur or the proprietor, they're starting the business at the very inception of the business 
with wage and salary employees. That generally indicates that um, it's a, they're pretty serious about the business. However, the literature finds that these smaller firms have uh, are maybe more sensitive to broadband availability. And so that kind of leads us to a hypothesis that we expect relatively larger effects of broadband availability for these non-employer establishment births or startups. We anticipate that women-led startups will follow the same pattern based on the, the literature. Women-led startups are more likely to be non-employers. And so we think that they um, uh, these women may be more sensitive to broadband availability when considering whether to start, um, start a firm or not. Um, so that's kind of our um, hypotheses. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll keep trucking through here to the empirical model so we can get to the, the fun results and discuss that. Um, all right, so um, our estimated model essentially is that we're gonna look at the BR, which is the birth rate, um, as a function of broadband and then regional or county level variables expected to determine the, the local establishment birth rate based on the existing literature, okay? And so these factors include financial capital, human capital, uh, natural capital or natural resources, also demographics and um, local economic conditions, okay? Um, a few things about the model. We, again, are only focusing on rural or non-metro counties in this model. And that's partly because the metropolitan counties are at this point in time have pretty ubiquitous broadband internet access. So we're particularly interested in these rural counties. Um, here I have the, the two classes, the non-employer and the employer size class and the female led and all. Um, we're also gonna be estimating the model using OLS and then we'll use two stage least squares for our IV, um, our IV strategy there. Let me talk a little bit more about the dependent variable first. The dependent variable, again, is the establishment birth rate calculated um, at the county level using firm level data from the National Establishment Time Series data set. Um, these data do have some well-documented disadvantages. They're based on Dun & Bradstreet data uh, with additional um, augmentation by Don Walls. So, um, so there are some disadvantages, but we think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. As I said, um, none of the publicly available data with, a, with geography in the US allow us to look at gender, right? So, so there are publicly available um, surveys in the US that allow us to look at gendered entrepreneurship, but none of them have a big enough N to really look at the um, regional or geographic components, okay? So that's why we decided the, the NETS data are the way to go. And we're especially appreciative to USDA, uh, US Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service for allowing us access to the NETS data. It's a very expensive data set at the, um, for the entire US. So we, uh, we appreciate that. Um, we're looking at establishment birth rates prior to the Great Recession. Uh, so this seems a little bit dated um, is an indication of how long we've been working on this paper <laughs> in, in, a, in a sense. Um, but uh, in, in rural U.S., um, it was very slow to recover from the Great Recession. In fact, uh, rural America's economy had not recovered from the Great Recession by the time we hit the COVID-induced recession last year, believe it or not. So um, another reason that we have this 2005 to 2007 period is it's when broadband was really being rolled out and um, it's, a, it's a period of growth, okay? We're trying to look at a period of growth and we figure if we can't find effects uh, during a period of growth, I don't know when we'd find effects, okay? We take a three-year average um, just because a lot of these very rural counties um, sometimes have zero births. So as an extension economist, some of the counties I serve have fewer than 2,000 people, okay? That gives you an idea of how teeny tiny these counties are. Uh, Sarah, so Sarah, yes. sorry. No, yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt, but just to be clear. So these are not net births. So it's not birth minus the one that died. These are just the new ones, correct? And it's the absolute it's, number, mm -hmm. but you divide that by the population. 
Yes, yes, okay. that's that's precisely correct. Yes, we are normalizing with population. We're just looking at births. Um, actually, Alessandra, if we look at the net growth for rural counties, it's negative. <laughs> They're really, we have so much, um, we have uh, actually had the first ever period of population decline during this period in, in rural America. And um, when you combine population decline with aging and with um, out migration of, of the young and the more educated, uh, we, we really rarely see uh, net growth, which is very shocking to the policymakers I work with. <laughs> so I'm glad you asked that. We're just looking at births, but we, Tessa and I have uh, done quite a couple papers now with these birth data. And um, the nice thing about the births, even if it's not on net, is it is indicating um, people are taking risks, new businesses are opening. Um, you know, there's undoubtedly some creative destruction going on there. Uh, um, less uh, innovative businesses are going out of business. So, but so we do find in rural areas that this um, the birth rate itself uh, is a pretty good way to assess the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, in the absence of growth of, of net economic growth. Um, these new businesses are the best thing these rural areas really have going. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same in Italy. So Is it? it makes sense. Yes. Good. Okay. That's good to know. Yes. It's kind of like the, the dirty secret that nobody really talks about, but you know, all of us rural economists know. Um, again, we're going to split the, the dependent variable into the non-employer, which we're calling one employee here, the proprietor herself, and those with um, at least one wage and salary employee. Now, our focal explanatory variable is going to be the number of broadband providers. These data were available at um, a lower level of geography, but not at the firm level, okay? So then what we did is we used GIS to um, create an average number of broadband providers in each county since all of our other explanatory variables are at the county level. So, so we're coming up with an average number of broadband providers in non-metro county. Um, there's uh, quite a few caveats to these data too, particularly in that they tend to overcount provision, okay? So due to that upward bias in the broadband availability data from the Federal Communication Commission, um, we're gonna actually interpret our point estimates uh, at the lower end of the confidence interval uh, to kind of make up for that. So let me dive into these two very important variables a little bit deeper. Oh, and I skipped a slide. Okay, so here we have two maps. Um, now, the first thing I'll point out on these maps is the white counties in these maps are the metropolitan counties, okay? So if you see white, here's Chicago, it's whited out, okay? So the colored counties are the counties in our study, okay? So um, Kansas City here, you know, is whited out. St. Louis is whited out. And all these colored counties are what we call non-metro or rural counties um, in the U.S. So on the left, we have the um, establishment birth rate calculated from the nets. The yellow and, and also on, the, uh, on both maps, uh, the lightest color is below average and the darkest color is at least one standard deviation above average. So we see a higher level of um, establishment births somewhat surprisingly in what we call the Great Plains. And so this is an area of the US with very low population density, okay? Um, and, and we see a lot of births there. And basically I think there's a lot of, of turnover also in the Great Plains, um, the level of human capital is relatively high, okay, particularly compared to the South or the Southwest. So we have relatively highly educated people in a, in a very sparse environment. And that combination of people, I think broadband is very conducive to them uh, in terms of creating businesses, okay? So that's, that's kind of the interesting thing with, with the birth rate there. The map on the right is our average broadband providers at the, at the county level. So when we white out the metropolitan areas, we see you know, a lot of underserved areas. But again, the, the rural areas that are better served do tend to be um, 
those with um, tourism, just like we saw with the websites. Okay, so. Uh, so sorry, I have another question. Yeah. Very quick. yeah. So these are uh, non-metro. So I know that there are metropolitan areas, micropolitan areas, and rural areas. The non-metro would be both micropolitan and rural. Yes, that okay. is precisely correct. Yes, uh, the micropolitan and the um, the non-micropolitan, non-metropolitan are are included here. Yes. So we're really just excluding the most urban. And um, for those of you unacquainted with metro areas in the US, which may be a lot of you, um, our base definition for a metropolitan area is there has to be at least one urbanized area with 50,000 people or more, okay? So we've got um, like this area down here in Missouri uh, has a, 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 at this point in time was just below 50,000. And now they're just above 50,000. So this is uh, Cape Girardeau in Missouri, and it's it's now the smallest metropolitan area in the U.S. So uh, so we are looking at there are certainly cities in our sample, but they're all cities um, with uh, 50,000 or fewer. And on on average, um, for these counties, they have 25,000 people on average. Good, great. Uh, just so just contemporaneously, this is what these same two maps look like with the most recent available data. The NETS data really do have a long time lag because they need um, quite a bit of time to revise and clean the data. So we've got births here, um, 2013 to 16. Again, we see high levels of births in, um, in the Great Plains and also now the Intermountain West. So we've had tremendous migration to the Intermountain West. Uh, so Rocky Mountains, Colorado, Wyoming, you know, Cowboy Land, uh, we, that's, the, that's the growing rural area of the U.S. And so that's where we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the births now. Um, and then this is what broadband availability looks like with the most recent available FCC data. And we see a, a lot of very rural regions, like this is North Dakota, South Dakota, again, very low population density here, but they've had tremendously successful state level policies and programs to incentivize internet service providers to provide broadband here. And so we, you really see that in, in the map. You can see the states that, that haven't had policies like Arkansas, um, and, and you can see the states that, that do have the policies. Now, the, these, this, these maps are for including the, the metro counties, okay? So of course, Chicagoland has the highest level, um, but just to give you kind of an idea of um, what the data look like um, contemporaneously. Okay, I'm not gonna go into uh, depth about all the other control variables um, because I like to talk and I'm talking too long, <laughs> but let me go through some of the basics. We set up a two-year lag structure, and that's because research has found um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem tends to influence startups um, after two years. So if the context is good for a firm birth, it takes about two years for that entrepreneur to get her, her, her wherewithal together, get her financial capital together, and for her to start that business. So we've got this kind of two-year lag structure. So we're looking at essentially... Um, explanatory variables from around 2003 and how they impact establishment births in 2005 to 2007, right before the, the Great Recession. Um, I've already alluded to financial capital, very important uh, uh, con control variable here for, for small businesses. And okay, so we control for the level of small business lending at the county level. We control for growth in small business lending at the county level, again, in this, this lag period, and also owner-occupied housing values. And, and that's because in the US, home ownership is prized. It's, um, there's a lot of policies to incentivize home ownership in the US. And then that um, equity one has in one's home can be tapped by entrepreneurs uh, in the form of a home equity loan. And that's, um, other than credit cards, that's one of the most uh, prevalent ways for financial capital um, leverage for, for new businesses. Sorry, Sarah, Sarah can, yes. I interrupt, can I interrupt you? Yes. I'm, I'm Sandra please. here. Could you, could you please elaborate a bit more about the kind of lending you're, you're controlling here? We, we yes. said the lender. 
Yes. So what we have in the U.S. is we have um, data from the Community Reinvestment Act, which is um, um, oversaw, overseen by the Federal Reserve Bank. And the mission of the Community Reinvestment Act is to ensure lending occurs in disadvantaged areas. So areas with um, more minorities um, and rural areas. OK, so but as a result, we have these data available at the county level. Um, Basically, the data are available at the bank level, and there's a county identifier for each bank. And so we had a, a student aggregate these bank level data to the county level. But is that is, is there um, banking loans? Yes, okay. yes, yes, they're banking loans. I would love to have, you know, geographic credit card data because that is the most prevalent source of financial capital. Uh, we just don't have that available. So these are these are legitimate um, from a bank lending. Um, and, and small business lending and growth in small business lending. So these are bank lending. And the banks, uh, Sandro, the banks are incentivized to lend to these small businesses because they kind of have to, as a part of this Community Reinvestment Act, mm. they have to lend to a certain amount of small businesses to balance their lending to the big guys. Mm. Um, so, so there is a little bit of incentive that there okay. for lend to small businesses and also to lend to small businesses in um, areas with a high minority population, um, high rural population, um, low and moderate income areas. Right, okay. right, okay. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, we're using Getzen Ripa Singha's Social Capital Index. This uh, index contains a lot of things, but essentially looking is looking at church adherence, community organizations, um, it's a kind of Putnam's bowling alone, uh, all boiled into one index and uh, nicely for us available at the county level. OK, so that's kind of our, our social capital control for human capital. We use the percent of adults with a bachelor's degree or higher. And, and we found in in rural areas, the percent of people with a bachelor's degree is much lower than in urban areas. But we really find that that's the best level of education when we're looking at entrepreneurship, okay? Those, um, those entrepreneurs with the bachelor's degree in rural areas are, have a much higher propensity to start businesses. We control for natural capital with the USDA ERS Natural Amenities Index, um, population density. And then we also calculated using GIS drive time. Uh, so drive time being on the road network, uh, not as the crow flies, drive time to a city with at least 100,000. Um, and we found, we, we calculated that actually for several different size cities, uh, 50,000, 100,000, 250,000. And we found that that access to a city of 100,000 or more is a real sweet spot for, for rural businesses. And interestingly, the US government uh, recently put forward a proposal to increase the definition of metropolitan from that 50,000 that I mentioned to 100,000. Uh, so a lot of people were very upset about that. Um, but as someone who'd been kind of using this measure with drive time to 100,000 and found it was a really useful measure, I kind of thought empirically, that is not a terrible idea. Um, okay, we're also, I'm talking way too much. We're also controlling for local economic conditions. So we've got um, Bartik's uh, predicted employment growth based on industry structure. Uh, we've got per capita income, the employment rate, um, we're controlling for demographics, um, ethnicity, race, um, and then kind of importantly for entrepreneurship and gender, um, the percent of adults who are married and the number of children under five per adult in a county, and then also the percent foreign born. My extension audiences in Missouri, most of whom are from Missouri, uh, they hate it when I tout this, but most of the entrepreneurs in the U.S. are foreign born. I'm, of course, a big fan. Um, so uh, we, we include that because um, there's not as many foreign born in rural America, um, but they do tend to be particularly entrepreneurial. So uh, you guys can't read this, but um, here's my summary statistics. And I'm happy to send the paper. You know, please send me an email uh, after the seminar. I'd be happy to, to send you the paper. But um, essentially, we have here our, our three different birth rates. We have our total birth rate, the two plus employees, the non-employer. Then we have the, the same for female. So the th same three for female. 
Then we've got our broadband access, which is our focal explanatory variable, then our lending variables um, and all those other control variables um, that are pretty common in the literature that I, that I just mentioned, okay? Deep breath. Okay, how are we gonna get back to this wicked problem where we talked about um, the relationship between broadband and, and entrepreneurship, okay? So does broadband incent entrepreneurship as we're hypothesizing? Or are internet service providers responding, uh, you know, basically entrepreneurship is creating um, opportunity for internet service providers to have customers. And so uh, the entrepreneurship is actually driving the broadband infrastructure installation. Okay, so there's this unclear relationship. Brian Whitaker at Oklahoma State has done a lot of work on looking at um, the difficulty in teasing out this relationship between broadband and, and entrepreneurship. And he hasn't come out and said it, but I'll come out and say it. You know, Ultimately, we may need to go to more of a systems approach. I, I just feel like regional science is gonna be moving in that direction um, more and more, the, the systems approach, because it's this causality is so difficult to tease out. And, and you know, in regions, everything affects everything, right? Um, but to be tractable today, we're going to use a suite of instruments um, as our dependent variable changes um, across the different specifications. So specifically, our, our three instruments are the Land Developability Index, uh, which was developed by Chi in 2010. That's available um, at the raster level, which can be aggregated up to the county level, which is really nice. This is a good instrument for um, infrastructure availability um, because of that, that raster level availability. Um, and it also includes um, a lot of different types of land that are very difficult to build on. So American Indian reservations, federal land, those are very difficult types of land to, to build on. It's very difficult. You know, I've got this picture here of, you know, the typical infrastructure for broadband in rural America. Um, you know, wire, uh, you know, hopefully fiber optic um, wire line and, and poles and the pole attachment fees, the permitting fees, the environmental impacts, um, very difficult. So as a, a, we expect to see less broadband infrastructure where some of these regulations, where the, um, there's American Indian loan, owned land, where, um, you know, there's water, of course, would be very difficult, where there's mountains, of course, it would be, be more difficult, okay? So we use that index, and that's an index that several others have, have used as an instrument for, um, for broadband, um, Coco and, and Brian Whitaker and um, some of these other papers have, have used that. So that's a, that's a pretty good, pretty well-tested instrument. It was a good starting point for us. Um, then kind of novel, to the literature is we use a topography Z score that actually was calculated by USDA. And it is different than the land developability index um, because the topography score is based on physical features of the land as it relates to elevation. So it's actually, um, uh, it's actually telling us whether the lands are plains, tablelands, hills, mountains, um, whereas slope, which is in the land developability index, is change in elevation defined over a distance, this topography Z score actually is looking at literally different types of um, topography. And then our third instrument, which doesn't always work, but worked in some specifications, was um, average commuting time to work. This one made a little bit less sense than the other two but it worked. <laughs> um, and we think that it's basically corresponding to re remoteness and lack of economic infrastructure. So if there's a long commute time, if it's a long drive time to that city of 100,000 or more, for example, um, then you're in a place with less infrastructure um, like, like broadband, essentially. So with that, I will move to the results. Ta-da! Our results confirm um, our hypotheses that broadband access does enhance um, rural startups in all models. It was a very strong result. Um, and the result was robust to our different, uh, our two different size categories. And it was the result held um, for all firms and also women-led firms. So let me, let me dive into this a little bit more. Um, 
Just in terms of the estimation, we do use census region fixed effects um, and robust standard errors. Our IV results uh, confirmed endogeneity. Um, we found uh, endogeneity in, in all models. Our first stage F indicated um, the instruments that I just talked about were strong. Um, broadband was over-identified with, um, with land developability and topography. Um, the commuting ended up working a little bit for the female, but the land developability index and the topography Z score um, over-identified broadband, which is awesome. Um, our, we used the Hansen's J to indicate that our instruments were uncorrelated with the error term. And um, of course, we estimated everything with OLS and um, our two-stage least squares. And luckily for us, the, um, our results were pretty consistent in sign and significance um, across both specifications. Uh, so that makes us feel pretty confident um, about the, this positive relationship that we found between broadband and the establishment birth rate. Um, Okay, so you guys can't read this. Again, this is kind of from the paper. I'm happy to send the paper, but um, I'm gonna just focus mostly on our focal explanatory variable broadband access. Yeah, question? No, okay. All right. Um, so what we have here, you can't read it, but basically we've got the birth rate for, for all, the birth rate for um, the two plus employees and the non-employer birth rate. And we've got the OLS and the IV and you can't read it, but um, oops, right here. Um, basically our broadband access variable is, is consistent and positive um, across all of those specifications. And um, since I, I, you can't read, since you can't read this, uh, let me do my extension style <laughs> presentation of, of the, the focal explanatory variable and its results, okay? And so this is kind of, I would never use the word econometrics. I would never use the word endogeneity when I, when I talk about extension, but this is kind of how I, um, how I take um, econometric results and, and use them in outreach, uh, third mission. Uh, and if you have better methods, I'd, I'd love to get your feedback. But Essentially, what we can do is we can tell our audiences, um, our non-technical audiences, that adding approximately one broadband provider to a rural county led to an additional 2.12 startups per thousand people. So in our average rural county in the U.S. with a population of 25,000, that's 53 startups. It's quite a lot. Majority of those startups are non-employers, okay? 41.5 are non-employers and 11.5 are employer startups. But that is to be expected. Um, in the U.S., non-employer businesses are 75% of all businesses nationally, okay? So these results are really on par with that average, okay? A lot of these non-employer businesses are very part-time, they're supplementary, um, gig work. Um, but so our results um, are, are pretty on par with the non-employer and the employer. Um, I'd also like, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to just emphasize that these um, point estimates are actually using the lower bound of the marginal effect um, due to this perceived upward bias in the broadband data. So if we actually use the mean, um, we actually would have 85 startups instead of 50, instead of 53. Okay. So 85 instead of 53 and, and 20 employer startups instead of 11.5. So we, we really are um, trying to be pretty conservative in interpreting our point estimates and for extension or third mission. I think that's really important because a number like 20, you know, 53 startups in a, in a typical rural County can really resonate to government to leadership in, in a rural county. Um, there's real dollars attached to that. And so my colleague, Alan Spell, does a lot of economic impact analysis. So he's, you know, he's using these econometric results. He's using these point estimates in his economic impact. So, so you know, he can calculate, you know, what is the economic impact of telemedicine? of distance learning for, um, for these rural communities. So it's important, I think, to translate our work um, so that it can be used um, by people like Alan and, and by county governments um, 
uh, to really help them with decision making and, and making wise, uh, important decisions. So again, that's our results for all. I want to switch now to our women-led firms, okay? So same thing with the women-led firms. We find a, a, a statistically significant um, positive relationship on broadband access for the women-led firms. Um, the coefficients are, are a little bit smaller, but you know we kind of expect that because um, we're taking a, a subsample of those that all firm category uh, and looking at women-led. Before I dive into the women-led results, I should actually mention a little caveat. We don't do women-led versus male-led due to a little uh, hiccup in the NETS data. So there's, there's not an indicator in the data for women-led, male-led, co-ed-led. So there's an indicator in the data for women-led or women-owned. Um, and then the omitted condition essentially is uh, male-led or co-ed-led. So there's no information in the data on male-led. So that's why we can't compare coefficients for women-led to male-led. Um, because we really only have, we have kind of men and, and co-ed led businesses in, in one group and we've got women led um, in another group. So a little bit of a caveat there, the, uh, trying to uh, ward off the uh, inevitable question people would ask, um, why don't you have a similar coefficient for male led firms? Okay, again, extension style, interpreting that coefficient. We find that there is an additional um, about two thirds of a startup. And so these startups are kind of, you know, think of it as a part-time gig per thousand people. So in our typical rural county with 25,000 people, that's 17 women-led startups due to one additional broadband provider. And of those 17, um, at least two are employer startups. So these are women-led firms with at least one wage and salary employee. That's pretty good. Again, these are calculated using the lower bound, so they're a little bit conservative. Uh, this 17 would be 28 if we calculated um, our um, uh, calculated this at the mean. Okay. So although the women-led number is smaller in absolute value relative to the mean um, number of women-led startups. Uh, these are actually larger in magnitude, okay? Uh, because women-led are, are, are uh, you know, about uh, less than 20% of the, of the sample, uh, not of the sample, it's a census. Women-led firms are less than 20% of the startups, okay? So um, although the, the women-led point estimate is maybe less exciting, less sexy than the total, uh, when you consider that women-led firms are fewer than 20% of our sample, this is actually pretty good. It's actually pretty, pretty darn amazing. Now, we're going to add um, a little bit, another little twist here with remote rural. Um, I'm not going to go into all the results and all the other explanatory variables. Again, I'm happy to send you the paper. Um, but I did just want to mention that um, consistent with the literature, we find sensitivity to, um, to lending and to growth in lending. And consistent with our hypotheses about uh, women-led firms and women entrepreneurs, um, we find that if there's more children under five per adult, there were fewer startups, okay? Kids under five are a lot of work. I have a five-year-old, I know. <laughs> um, and um, again, this uh, dis driving time to a city of a uh, hundred thousand or more, um, if uh, the the the, um, the birth rate increased with that greater distance, so we actually see more births the further you are from the city of a hundred thousand, and that's actually pretty consistent because if you're relatively close to a city of a hundred thousand, your um, job opportunities. Maybe you're not commuting into the center city, but there are um, thick wage and salary job opportunities in the periphery and the suburbs of that city. And so as you get into a more remote rural context, there are more births. And a lot of that is just because there aren't other opportunities. You have to create your own opportunity if you're living in North Dakota, right? Um, and so 
So the startups were more prevalent in remote rural counties. And so um, then we decided to, to dig into that a little bit more and, and do a robustness check on, on remote rural. So we add to our specification a um, dichotomous variable for remote rural. Um, now, how are we defining remote rural? Um, Alessandra mentioned earlier micropolitan. Uh, and micropolitan in the US are counties with a city between 10,000 and 50,000. So there's micropolitan and then there'd be non-metro, non-micro. We're actually defining remote rural a little bit different. We find that the adjacency, that drive time, really overrides the economic importance of a city of 10,000. Um, and so we, we use remote rural as essentially, um, we call remote rural non-metropolitan, so we're excluding our metro as we have for the whole study, but also not adjacent to a metro county. So we find that those people who are adjacent to a metro county, I think there's more commuting, there's less incentive to start one's own business. Um, and so this remote rural is you know, saying, you're at least a county away from a metro county. Now, to those of you who've worked with uh, US county level data, a big caveat here is the heterogeneity in the size of counties in the US, frankly, okay? So the further west you go, you get very large counties. Uh, in the east, which was settled before the automobile, we have relatively small counties, but it seems to work fairly well. So we interact that remote rural uh, dummy with, with broadband access. And really what we found is that um, the remote rural counties, while they had fewer startups, they're more sensitive to broadband, which is kind of consistent with our, with our model, right? And especially the women-led remote rural startups, they were the most sensitive. So if, you, if, you're, if you're in a remote rural area, you're far from a metropolitan area, these women-led firms were really, really sensitive to broadband. Um, so these women-led um, firms are, are, the women-led result actually for all non-metro counties was really driven by the high women-led startup rate in the remote rural counties. If you actually just looked at women-led in um, non-metro adjacent, the results are pretty weak. So really, um, it's this remote rural. Now, because we have firm level data, we were able to kind of dig in and see what's going on there. A lot of those uh, remote rural women-led firms are daycares, a lot of them, okay? So what's happening is women are, and some of them are at-home daycares with no employers, so this is a non-employers, but others are small daycares with a, with a handful of employees. And I think there's something going on in which broadband may be enabling women in that remote rural area to work. And that's uh, really creating more demand for, for childcare, for daycare. Of course, women-led firms, um, uh, there's a lot of, of daycares uh, compared to male-led daycares too, okay? So uh, so the remote rural finding was, was really pretty fun. I saw a hand raised, was there a question? I think Julia had, uh, Julia, did you want to ask something now or later? Uh, no, no, it's okay, also later, thank you. Okay, thanks, Julia. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. I know I can talk. Um, we're almost done, I promise. <laughs> um, okay, so policy implications, conclusions, future work. Um, in terms of policy implications, I think this uh, result is, is really interesting because it holds across all sectors, across these two different size classifications, and it holds for women-led startups. And I think uh, particularly post-COVID, this women-led startup finding should be used by policymakers. So as an extension economist, that's part of my job is to translate, um, distill down what's happening in the academic literature and give it to uh, the legislators um, in Missouri and let them know that, hey, women have, have pulled out of the labor force, but perhaps uh, all this investment in broadband that we're doing right now should be accompanied by um, some entrepreneurial ecosystem building by some education on how to start a business. And it could really help these women 
in remote rural areas um, in Missouri, just as a, an example, okay? So I think there's implications for childcare, there's implications for women-led businesses. There's um, certainly strong, I think, um, evidence that broadband access is um, part of a supportive entrepreneurial ecosystem. And um, right now we're, we're really building out broadband in rural America. There's a lot of money available. So we should be thinking about particularly some communities are just really more attuned to this entrepreneurial ecosystem than other communities. You know, communities that are manufacturing oriented, they don't care too much about entrepreneurship. They don't come to my extension programs. But there are other communities that um, have been as particularly farming dependent communities. Uh, and there's now very little labor in farming. So those communities are um, very interested in entrepreneurial ecosystem building. And so we should encourage those communities to invest in broadband access. I think farmers are kind of inherently innovative. They've got to fix problems. They've got to fix machinery when they're out there. Um, so there's um, generations of, of farmers that have kind of that innovative flair. And it might be, it might be really great to get them access to broadband and to build the entrepreneurial ecosystem in those um, rural areas. Before I conclude, I just want to kind of say, I think where the literature is moving now is um, adoption. And I mentioned this in the introduction too. So, so this paper focused on broadband access, so access to the infrastructure and adoption is really um, the next step. So this chart is probably a little small for you to see, but let, let me kind of um, summarize it. It starts with the most rural counties and it goes down to the most urban counties. The blue is uh, the lowest income households and the gray are the highest income households. And, and the bar chart is essentially households that do not have the internet. So this is um, those that don't have the infrastructure, but also those who have access to the infrastructure and haven't adopted. And in the US, in, in, in rural areas, the adoption rate is only about 60%. So if you, if you were to ubiquitously bring broadband internet to a rural county, you could only expect after 10 years, 60%, just over half of the households to actually subscribe to the internet. So that's really muting some of these economic and entrepreneurial benefits um, that we see from broadband. But I think a lot of the adoption issue is affordability. Okay, and so we see this here. The lower income households in more rural areas are much less likely to adopt, um, but where incomes are higher in the gray bar over here, they have it, they have access, and they're adopting it. Okay, so this to me says we really need to focus on not only access, but affordability. And the affordability, when I'm out doing my extension work and talking to people on the ground, the affordability comes in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is the high startup cost or fixed costs. So when I lived in Washington, D.C., I think I had to pay $3,000 to have fiber built, built to my home. To my home. Um, if I'm in a low-income household, you know, making $20,000 a year, nobody's going to spend $3,000 <laughs> uh, getting, you know, fiber to the premises, Okay. So there's the startup costs um, tend to be high. The monthly subscription costs. In rural areas, the monthly subscription cost for broadband is much higher than in urban areas of the U.S. And I would be interested to know what the situation is in Italy. Um, and it, frankly, of course, is due to competition. Where there is no competition, they're charging exorbitant amounts of money for this monthly um, subscription cost. Whereas in urban areas where there are maybe three or four different internet providers to a particular household, um, the, the monthly cost is much lower. Uh, a little anecdote, where I live here now in Missouri, there's only one broadband provider to my home and I pay $120 a month. Um, a few blocks over, so a 10 minute walk away, uh, they have three providers and they, the same provider I have charges $60 a month, okay? So that competition will really bring down um, the price and increase um, adoption. And of course, in rural areas, there's also just the digital literacy issue. There's, um, do households have a computer? Are they connected? Um, 
lots of other issues. But I, I see, I think the next phase of, of the research that Tessa and I are doing in this regard, we'll be kind of looking at um, this adoption and we're very interested in seeing if women are maybe more likely to adopt also. Um, so uh, kind of here's my concluding slide. I think I've said a few things, most everything here. Um, there are some caveats with the broadband data and also the, the firm birth data. Um, I think I mentioned all of those today. Um, our results seem pretty robust. Uh, we're pretty excited about the gender aspect of the results. And um, what, I, what I really like about this is um, the potential for broadband to equitably enhance um, economic opportunities and entrepreneurship in rural America. I think if we can get the adoption rate higher, it will um, enable more people to have access to technical assistance um, that they need to start a business. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the current firms are led by white male, um, but it would be great if, if, if non-employer firms, those very small firms and women-led firms, uh, it would be great if they can access technical assistance through um, the small business development centers we have in the U.S., if they can access that technical assistance through the broadband um, and really get their business going because they, um, they have the connectivity. So uh, with that, I'll conclude. I've gone over my hour. I apologize, Alessandra. Uh, here's my email. Please email me if you would like um, coordinates to the paper. I can also send the slides to Sarah um, if, if you guys would like the slides and um, I'll have uh, the link in there. Oh, and then this is, uh, this, sorry, this is the, uh, my extension broadband website. So if you wanna get an idea of kind of what third mission looks like in the US in terms of uh, distilling broadband research down and making it available to communities, feel free to check out my extension website. Thank you very much, Sarah. I guess, you know, well, virtual applause. That was really interesting. Although it was a little bit longer, I didn't miss a single bit of it because you were very enthusiastic and very clear in presenting it. So thank you very much. So what we normally do, we allow the youngest uh, members of our community <laughs> to actually ask questions first. So there are quite a few PhD students and I already see two of them wanting to ask you a question and then we'll go to the more senior uh, degree. We'll go by degree of seniority, but starting with the more junior. So Eleonora, if you wanna start and then Julia. Hi, uh, thank Hi, you very much for the presentation. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, since uh, most of the, the entrepreneurship literature focus also on the risk and risk aversion, if you have considered some sort of uh, control for this, and also if uh, you think that uh, it could be measured, I don't know, for example, by the age of the people, because I've seen you put some demographics as control and I'm wondering if uh, the age is one of them. And uh, yeah, that's it, thank you. Yeah, no, I think the, the risk aversion is a really great idea, Eleonora. Um, and it would be very interesting. Essentially, I can't do that with these data, but I do think it would be something to think about with a, with a model, um, particularly using, in the US one would have to use survey data to get that kind of information and then we lose the geographic component. Um, so the next data that I'm using for the establishment birth, it, it really is administrative data, right? And, and so we have, in the US, we have, I think a lot less data than a lot of countries in Europe, uh, less access, there's a lot more worry about privacy. So all we really have for our data are what's observable from the outside. Um, so these Dun & Bradstreet data are data kind of gleaned from say loan applications. Um, literally people go through the yellow pages and kind of see, you know, is the owner a woman? Uh, you know, where's the business located? How many employees? They're, they're getting all of that from secondary. So unfortunately, I don't think we could get at risk preferences or risk aversion. Um, we also can't get at age, right? Because we don't have that in the data. When I said, um, and this is very confusing, um, all my explanatory variables are at the county level and even the firm level data for the, for the um, dependent variable, we've aggregated up to the county level. 
So we're controlling for average, you know, you can control for average age in a county, um, but we couldn't necessarily control for age of, of women-led startups, unfortunately, with the data. But I think in Europe, much better data are available. So maybe that's, are you interested in entrepreneurship research yourself? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, really interesting for me. It was really interesting, this presentation. So, yeah. Good, uh, yeah. I was also wondering, I don't know if you can check because you have uh, the loan uh, um, data. If a person has... Uh, close and reopen a business uh, asking for more than one loan because it's also pretty common in USA but uh, not very common uh, in for example Italy so I was wondering uh, if you can also yes. uh, see that so the loan data again is only available at the county level so we're not actually able to look at the loans for say the women-led businesses we're just looking at small business lending that the ecosystem of small business lending in that particular county. Um, now, I think the, the turnover question that you ask is, is a brilliant question. And um, I think I may be wrong. I think you're um, telling me that in Europe, there tends to be less churn amongst businesses than in the U S Alessandra is nodding. Yes. So yeah, in, in the U.S., we tend to have a lot, uh, it's very easy to start a business and it's very easy to close a business in the U.S. And it actually varies a lot state by state. When I first came to Missouri and I was looking at um, birth rates, I thought, oh my God, and you guys might've noticed it in one of the maps, I thought, my goodness, why are there so many births, um, employer establishment births at that? And partly it's because the only thing you have to do to start a business in Missouri is um, mail a $25 check which is nothing, right? Uh, so it's very easy in Missouri compared to our neighbor state in Illinois to start a business. So, um, so that is very interesting that there's less of this churn in Europe. And I think culturally, like coming from Scotland, I can see that. I can see uh, that that's a kind of a cultural thing and, and there's less churn. But yeah, in the US, our bankruptcy laws are such that it really is pretty easy <laughs> You know, you can start a business on your credit card and if it doesn't work out, you can claim bankruptcy and then you have a clean slate in five years and you can do the same thing over again. Um, so it's uh, a very conducive environment for, um, for experimentation and trying things. Now, interestingly, the entrepreneurship levels in the US have really been declining uh, since the 90s. So really going down, except for a blip um, starting last year. Uh, so uh, the, the blip in entrepreneurship at births that started last year, we're unable to get those data by gender yet. But I'm very interested to see if this increase, the, the first increase really in, in business applications in the U.S. for probably 30 years uh, was, was last year during COVID. I'm very interested to see if, if that's women-led. And we see that blip in, in urban and rural. Julia? Okay, and um, good afternoon and thank you for the presentation. Really inspiring and uh, interesting. Um, is, I'm, I have not a real question, but a uh, curiosity. And um, there are evidence or um, results about the age of the leaders uh, of, start of startups leaders. You, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the curiosity was about the age of the entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we just don't know. Although, you know, I do have firm level data, um, age is not the, the variables in the data set. So really the only, the only demographic information we have on these firms is gender and race ethnicity. And Tessa and I played around with the race ethnicity data, and we think it's pretty poor, pretty poor quality. So we decided not to use the race ethnicity data, but we felt like the, the female led or the female owned variables were worthy of being used. So more, uh, more data limitations that maybe Julia, you can conquer um, using you know, better data that are, are available in Europe. Cause I, I think you're right. I think the age and it kind of ties to what Eleonora said um, about risk preference and age and human capital, these things are, 
are really intertwined. And it will be very interesting to see, you know, as an extension economist, I'm always trying to look into the future. Okay, so I, I do a lot of work advising policymakers. I'm always trying to think, I'm always trying to stay one step ahead of them. <laughs> what are they going to ask me in two years, right? That's how long it takes me to do my research. So, but but uh, as for both of you as young scholars, I, I love this, that you're interested in age and risk, and, and, and I think human capital should be in there too. And what's going to happen to, you know, as, as young people, people who are young now, people who are your age now, as you, um, you know, get more closer to my age or Alessandra's age, uh, what's going to happen to that risk preference? And a lot of times I think there's, you know, waxing and waning, but I think also then there's cultural components that will stay um, as you as you move through different uh, age cohorts. So very interesting question. I'm, I'm actually not well-versed really on the entrepreneurship literature around age myself. Um, and again, in the U.S., we really can't get data like that at a fine level of geography. And um, although this paper didn't use it, I'm really interested in spatial analysis. Um, so I tend to focus more on, on the geographic component. Um, myself, just, um, you know, the data, the data limitation, you can either have geography or age in the US. So. Just to give you a little bit of background, Julia is actually working on a project <clears throat> together with me and, and uh, Julia Urso, I don't know if she's connected today. Um, and she's very interested in young people in peripheral areas. And she's leading a national team, which is actually also connected with the government on this topic of of, uh, of young people in peripheral areas. And I guess that, that is why she was asking you the question about age, because we are focusing especially on younger uh, people, why uh, they wanna stay or go back uh, or uh, to, to these peripheral areas. And we are looking at, uh, Julia, remind me, what is the, the age? It's up uh, till to 40 years old, right? That is the boundary. Uh, no, under 40. Under 40, yes. So it's, yeah. It's, yeah. That's, oh, that's very that's... interesting. Julia, if you, um, if you are interested in the, the U.S. context, I'll give you a little tip. We have a program called FFA, and it used to stand for Future Farmers of America in the U.S., and it's very popular in rural areas. And they, uh, it's in high schools and teaches you how to be a farmer. But as fewer and fewer people uh, got to be in farming, that's when they changed their name from Future Farmers of America just to FFA. Uh, as fewer and fewer people are in farming, they switched their emphasis to leadership development and entrepreneurship development. And we actually see that here at University of Missouri. We're a land-grant university, which means we get disproportionately large number of people from rural areas um, for our agricultural programs, which are our specialty. And so we do actually see a lot of, you know, I, I think a lot of young people don't come to university, but the ones that do come to university, a lot of them here in Missouri want to go back. They've had this FFA leadership and entrepreneurship experience, and they're here on campus to get more entrepreneurial experience, a lot of interest in, in um, you know, pitch competitions and these sorts of things. So um, that might be something for you to, to look, look up and see if there's something comparable in Italy. Um, or see if someone has looked at kind of really the impacts of that on, on of that program on entrepreneurship. I'm not aware of, of that study, but it would be interesting. Sandro, you're not really junior, but you seem to be next. No one else is actually raising yeah, their yeah. hand. No, I, I'm the grandpa, but if, if, if someone wants to go ahead before myself, I will be happy. I, I don't know. Is there anyone? No, not really. So, Begrantha, go ahead. Uh, so, Sarah, thank you very much. That was a very interesting piece of work. So, uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, and also quite standing in terms of uh, aspects that you cover. Uh, I would have uh, three questions. Um, the first one refers to the dependent variable that, that you use, the, the, the birth rate, right, of, of, these, of these firms, which to me is a sort of... Um, sparkle to entrepreneurship because you really don't know what happens to this uh, you know newly established firms soon after their birth right so you don't know the extent to which they are capable to pass through a famous valley of death which, which is which is to me quite crucial so first question is uh, I suspect that the answer will be no but would it be any chance to track 
this birth rate and see what happens soon after the birth rate to see whether, you know, there's at least some trace of survivor. Because to me, uh, this is the crucial aspect in the story mm -hmm. of, of entrepreneurship. The, the second, you want me to go, how do you want to reply one by one? I don't know. Yeah, no, look, I can respond to that. It might just be easier in my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, one could do that. Um, could in this data set track the firm's longitudinally and, you know, for five years, see if they get through kind of that, that first five years, which seems to be the most tenuous. Um, that would definitely be a possibility. I have not done that. I don't know. Uh, you know, John Haltewanger has done similar kind of work with a similar kind of data set. Frankly, the challenge is um, the N. You know, we're a huge country. And so this data set has every, every firm in the country. Um, and so it's not something Tessa and I have tackled, mostly because we don't have the computational wherewithal. We would need a we would need a, a computer scientist, I think, to get on board with us and, and, a, and a, a server, I think. Um, but it would definitely be possible. It would be very interesting. What I will say, Sandro, is I did do a, a, a business survival study, in, um, but it was focused on manufacturing. But I looked at a rural urban and I was very in, interested in local context and entrepreneurial ecosystem and how that affected business survival in the rural U.S., and I found tremendously high survival rates in rural areas. And as you got into remote rural, mm. the survival rates were even higher. I mean, to the point that any rational firm would have closed, right? And um, again, using my extension, you know, so the data tell me one thing. So I go out for extension and talk to people. And um, really, it's uh, this cultural component. So a lot of these rural businesses... Um, Basically, I found the highest survival rate for the locally owned rural businesses. If it was, you know, owned by some investors or something, they tend to close, you know, right away. But those locally owned firms, there was this culture and they said, well, we have to protect the jobs for the people in our region or a lot of our family members work for this business. So we have to stay open no matter you know, you're not, you know, no matter that marginal costs far exceed marginal revenue. So there's this kind of cultural component. Again, a limited applicability because it was just manufacturing, but um, but it, it the survival piece is really interesting, and I really do think there are differences for rural, um, and I would love to see a women-led survival. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I think it's, it would be interesting, and it's nice to to know that you could do it potentially, right? Yeah, uh, I think too. If we did women level, women-led only, that reduces our end by eighty <laughs> percent. Credibility. I like it. I'm writing that down. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I can I go to a question? Because number two is is about uh, instruments, uh, which which is uh, not a uh, original piece piece of your work. Um, um, I mean, I'm not entirely familiar, but I've read something about instrumenting broadband penetration in other papers, right? And uh, and of course, as usual, these instruments work well or not, depending on, on, on the dependent variable that you have. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not entirely persuaded by the fact that these three are so orthogonal to, to birth rate. I don't know. Some of them, at least two of them, to me, they also speak to, to birth rate. Uh, could you convince me <laughs> that is not the case? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, the idea is that the, the topography or the land ownership, you know, whether it's a swamp or a mountain, is, is um, the idea is that it's exogenous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, indeed, and it, the idea is that it's highly correlated. It is highly correlated with the broadband, right? It's just literally more expensive. To no put. doubt about that. But by my job, um, is that these are. So I, I see. Right? I I see. I see you, particularly when you look at that map. And I talked about the the birth rate in the Intermountain West and how that's taking off. Okay, um, I see your point, Sandro. I, I don't want to, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot, of, but a lot of it is, um, you know, all the growth in rural America is in these high natural amenity areas, and these high natural amenity areas have 
pleasing topography. Nobody wants to look at the plains. Nobody wants to look at North Dakota where you can see for some reason yeah. it's so flat, right? They want to see mountains. They want to see hills. They want to see lakes. They want to see trees. You don't just want to see maize, 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 maize in Iowa. Uh, so, so I'm with you. I think that it is a bit, it's a bit dodgy, but the statistics work. Yeah, no, no, I know. I've seen. Yeah, I've seen. But <laughs> I wasn't entirely convinced by say by, by the argument, but okay, good, good that they work at least in econometric terms. And very last point, and uh, Alessandra, I don't want to monopolize the time, so sorry for that. Uh, just a curiosity, which comes from a work I'm, I've been doing with uh, Francesca Ginami, who I don't know whether she's here as a PhD student was, about the geography of venture capital uh, in Italy. Uh, you basically control for this uh, bangalongs across across the areas. Uh, did you also have a chance to control also for yeah the geography of venture capital? I don't know to which extent this could be relevant. If there's again uh, also here, um, I was call sort of of gap or concentration of venture capital in certain areas. They are not entirely present there. It doesn't make a difference. Is it relevant? So it's just just a, a curiosity. Yeah, um, in the U in the U.S. the 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 inner of the U.S. is so huge. I think compared to the inner of Italy, right? Uh, where am I going with this? We really have very while there is venture capital in rural America, it is really very rare. I suspected that. Yeah, partly because so I do work with a, a VC firm based out of St. Louis. And they um, are primarily targeting ag related businesses. Okay. And so let me use them as an anecdote. It is very difficult, you know, as a VC, they want to provide that technical assistance. It was very difficult for them to do that with remote firms, even more so without broadband. So they're paying to bring the proprietor into St. Louis for training periodically, for mentoring periodically. And, um, and frankly, it's very expensive for the VC firm and it's very expensive for the entrepreneur to spend a lot of time traveling to St. Louis to do these trainings, to learn, traveling back. Um, and I think that's why we see so little VC in, in rural America. I think, you know, this study is also including these non-employer firms, which no VC is, is going to be interested in. But I, I think if we narrowed the scope a little bit to, you know, Firms that maybe have at least ten wage and salary employees, then, yeah. yeah. Then the the VC uh, might be more relevant. Um, now, in addition, I don't know if you're interested in other types of similar capital, but there's a lot of interest in rural US in revolving loan funds, mm -hmm. and these are very locally based, and so um, local governments can get money from the US Department of Agriculture, a big pot of money to start a revolving loan fund. And um, of course they lend it out and the idea is some of it gets paid back and, and they can continue lending it out. Uh, the technical assistance piece that I think is so cool about VC isn't there. Uh, and so that technical assistance piece really is a big barrier in rural America. And I think, but I think that's another reason why broadband is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Every small business development center. So the small business development centers in the US are all kind of state-based. Um, they just started providing virtual counseling right before COVID started. So it used to be, you'd literally have to, just like if you had the VC in St. Louis, you'd have to literally go drive to Kansas city to get some technical assistance, which is very off putting to rural people. They really like to have people come to them. So as extension, they like it when I come to them, they are not going to come to me to campus, um, so that technical assistance piece, I think, is, is very interesting and much more prevalent than VC. So I think if I were doing um, a study in, in rural America, I might look at the technical assistance piece before I look at the VC. Position. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, thanks. Great questions. I, I, um, and I love the, the women-led survival study idea. Thanks. <laughs>
So I do have some questions myself since nobody else seems to have raised their hands, last but not least. Uh, some of these are questions, some of these are more observations or curiosity and whatever. Um, okay, so you have to, I have to start by saying that Sandra and I are very well known to actually think the same thing. So <laughs> of course, isn't that true, Sandra? Right. Um, so maybe he sends me an email and at the same time I'm sending him an email with exactly the same topic and then we cross emails with it. So uh, I had thought about the survival thing as well. Uh, and so um, I think it, it's worth investing maybe in a PhD student can do some programming. You don't need a computer scientist because they're very smart young people right now. Even my son who is 10 started programming with blocks and I'm like, okay, you know. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. they're, they're very, they do things, uh, the PhD students that uh, I could not even dream about or I, I wouldn't have dreamt when I was doing my PhD. But yeah. I think because that would add a, a big piece to your story, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Sandro, I like how Sandro called them a spark of entrepreneurship, but then you need to know whether it kind of right. it gets into a flame. Um, okay, so another thing that another comment I had was uh, you um, using the drive time to define remoteness and whatever. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, if you need more evidence that this is a good way of doing things, in Italy, we have uh, this um, national strategy for inner areas, and they define six degrees basically of remoteness, they use driving times to essential mm -hmm. services. Um, and there is a whole bunch of papers, including some that, that uh, we, are, we have been working on that actually say, okay, this is uh, not perfect, but it's a good way, a good approximation to actually define remoteness. So I think that it, it's great. I like the that's, drive time. That was, that's great. I would love if, uh, I'd love to see a few of those papers. That would be, right. that would be uh, really great. Then uh, your point about adoption. So having data on adoption would be great, of course. But I think that between the number of providers and adoptions, so between the data on the number of providers and adoptions, there is maybe a compromise, which is data on coverage. So number of providers is very rough because you can have essentially 10 providers, but covering like 10% of a county, right? While at least in Italy right now, and I know because I've been working a little bit on, on this topic recently, we do have data on coverage. And now with the COVID, there is a huge debate uh, on the digital divide in Italy, well, in Italy, in Europe in general. And the way we define the digital divide is using data on coverage and speed. So you can have access to the internet, but if it's very slow, it doesn't allow you to actually do smart working. That's not a good use. I had to change uh, my broadband and I have the fiber optics as well. Actually, they, they, I, don't have, I, don't, I didn't have to spend 3000 uh, euros or anything like that because they are actually doing with COVID right now. They're actually doing it for you as long as you subscribe to their and also, you did ask us if there was heterogeneity in the cost between rural and urban areas. I don't think so, not very much. I guess it's also because of the size of Italy. We don't really have rural, rural like you do in the US or in Australia or whatever, right? So it's actually, it's more yeah. dense in a sense, so it's easier. Um, but even uh, when we have to use uh, uh, a type of broadband, which is uh, kind of using the satellite rather than the cable because it's more mm. rural, it's a little bit more, but it's not the same difference that you notice right from you and your neighbors. And, um, and more or less the cost, I've just changed right to fiber and I'm paying exactly the same as I was paying before with a different provider, which is 30 euros per month. And that's pretty mm -hmm. standard. You can, you can have that for, um, right. So um, what that's I also- That's interesting. That's what, interesting to know. I love that. I love the additional context from other places. So what I also find very interesting, surprising, and I think, you know, you, you obviously didn't forecast COVID, but then your research became even more important with COVID, right? Uh, it's this effect that you found in the mountain rural Northwest, because I was just wondering now, it's very likely that with COVID, maybe more people would like to move into this scenic, uh, natural beauty, you know, uh, um, but to me, it was surprising that you were already finding it 
from 2013 to 2016. And I was just wondering yeah. if it was linked to some kind of specific sector, I don't know, extraction or gas drilling. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it had something to do with, with natural resources uh, also. Yeah. Um, okay, so I find it very interesting. I, you know, you know a little bit what I've done in the past. So I've done a lot of work on migration and yeah. although your uh, slide was kind of was small, the number, the one that caught my eyes immediately was the percentage, the share of foreign born population, because mm -hmm. it's always very significant, uh, kind of big magnitude and negative. Uh, mm -hmm. And in all your talk, basically, I was thinking, well, is that because we are not really talking about necessity entrepreneurship, and we are talking more about opportunity entrepreneurship. And then if you actually redo your analysis, but you are actually looking at women and the COVID effect, I agree with you that you would probably find a lot more women, but I actually think that's necessity entrepreneurship. So yeah. it's a different, it's a different type of entrepreneurship, maybe. I, I was surprised, to be honest, that the foreign born were so negative. Um, because in Italy, for instance, in peripheral areas, we do also have this uh, necessity entrepreneurship uh, by migrants that come in mm -hmm. and have some kind of ideas. I mean, maybe there are not so many to influence the aggregate results, but we do have mm -hmm. some example of this. And so it's important to define or at least to hint uh, whether you think that it's more necessity or opportunity entrepreneurship. Uh, and the last thing yes. in general, I would like to see more kind of descriptive statistics on uh, the women-led uh, businesses versus uh, the other one, the mixed one and the one that are uh, led by men. For instance, uh, you divide by non-employers establishment and the one with employers, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, employees. Um, I was, for me, what I would ex have expected is that the women led are maybe smaller because they're more maybe necessity, especially the, the more recent one. I'm, unfortunately, I'm thinking more about COVID than, than your, the period you are analyzing because yeah. there is a little bit of a bias right now. Um, but for instance, is, is that the case? Is it the case that uh, the non-employee one are actually more women led? And also, do you find differences by say macro area of the US in the percentage yeah. of women led uh, businesses, because these are really big cultural factors. I know you have fixed effect your control for counties, but I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the mm -hmm. South versus the Northeast versus the uh, Middle East versus whatever. Um, so it would be it kind of, it would, I think it would enrich your story if you had a little bit more of these um, maps uh, looking at this um, at this this yeah just out of curiosity cultural things i guess but it yeah. was a great presentation thank you very much really truly thank enjoyed. you no i appreciate those um great ideas tessa and i actually have another paper under review um in which we do have some maps of that female um birth rate and you do definitely see regional differences, right? The South is very different and the Dakotas are very different. So there's definitely some um, cultural pieces there. And, and, um, and the necessity entrepreneurship, I think is highly correlated with that. I think it's a little difficult with administrative data to really ascertain necessity versus entrepreneurship. I think that's better measured with survey data we could really get at the entrepreneur's intent you, you know what you could do though look at unemployment yeah. rates uh, or female labor market participation and see mm -hmm. if uh, what you find is a response maybe delayed to an increase I, in this uh, in this uh, tightness of the labor market that's a good idea to look at the female labor market participation you know maybe lagged a few years yeah i like i really like that that's good on the migration piece, Alessandra, um, maybe I'll, since there are no other, oh, Fabiano has a question. I can let Fabiano go first. But I want, if we have time, I'll come back to the migration. Fabiano, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sara, for, for your very interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering, uh, as Alessandra did, about the, the difference uh, in the definition of remoteness in the US and, and in Italy. And Alessandra told you that uh, uh, we, we have a, a partially different way in defining remoteness. Uh, basically, we, we assess uh, the, the, the 
commuting time to access uh, some kind of basic services like health, like uh, school education, and like transportation system. So, I, but I, I, at the very end of the history, I think that uh, they, they define the same process because uh, you implicitly state that uh, your kind of uh, uh, territorial organization is monocentric. So uh, you, you just have to access the city in order to access this kind of services. On the contrary, in Italy, we have a more polycentric uh, um, I'm gonna say, organization of the territory. So we, we must be aware of the, that the services can be located in, in different cities and not just in the same one. So, but at the very end of the story, I think that we, we I'm gonna say, we map the, 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 the same uh, kind of remoteness, we can say. Uh, considering that there is a different territorial organization between the US and Italy, of course. And the second observation, it, it is very interesting, in my opinion, the fact that uh, uh, you told us that there are farmers which are very interested in um, using the internet technologies. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, if we look at the history in, the, in our Apennines, in our mountain areas, um, residents in those areas uh, were had a, a multi-source uh, earnings. So basically they were farmers, yes. they were temporary migrants, they were shepherds, they were timber, and meaning that they, they could survive in a very um, hard uh, environment, difficult environment, because of uh, this capacity to uh, integrate different sources of, uh, of uh, income. And I think that uh, using uh, uh, internet, it's, uh, it's uh, up to date, this, uh, this, this capacity, which was uh, really peculiar in our inner and, and uh, mountain areas. And, and it's something that uh, in, um, for instance, the uh, strategy for inner areas is trying to implement in inner areas, allowing people living there to to benefit from different sorts of earnings related to tourist activity, uh, craft uh, activities, uh, and, and so on. Yeah, those are great, great comments. I think you're right on the multi-source earnings and, and um, that kind of gritty resilience really makes for um, that entrepreneurial spark uh, to play off what Sandro said too. So yeah, I really, I really appreciate those comments. Sarah, thank you very much. It's six o'clock pretty much. So we did keep yeah. you for about two hours, but it was very pleasant and I hope it was pleasant for you as well. And you know, you have an open invitation to the GSSI whenever you want to come, you know, even for a visiting period or whatever, maybe you should come before your son goes to school. Is he five? Is he going to elementary school yet? Yeah, um, he's going to, he'll start this yeah. fall. Yes. Too start bad, you should have come before. See, COVID didn't allow that. <laughs> It becomes a little bit more difficult, uh, you know, talking from experience when they yes. go to school. But anyway, you have really an open invitation to come for as Thank long you. as you want, visiting or whatever. And we, we love that. welcome you with open hands. You could bring um, your dogs too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are sheep here. You know, yeah. <laughs> the, the Abruzzo, is Abruzzo is very famous for, for this uh, even uh, meat, right? And, and uh, kind of food the coming from sheep so yeah i love <laughs> yeah, it for sure we can okay. use your dog <laughs> i love it the whole family is welcome <laughs> thank you so much for having me thanks for the excellent discussion and um i will be sending the paper and the powerpoint to sarah and and she will pass it along to all of you and it was, um lovely lovely conversation for me um it's can, I, can i just add a final thing that you actually yeah. remind me we have a discussion paper series here at the Grand Sasso Science Institute. So uh, if you have any recent kind of job you would like to submit in case, just, just think about it. And, <laughs> and it's a proper working series with a code, with an ISSN. Is that how it's called? I ISBN, ISSN. We are, listed, we are listed wherever we could. The, the, important <laughs> thing is, the important thing is that we promise to provide uh, uh, a very fast light review of, 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 of each uh, submission, right? So in, in one week, we basically promise to provide a, not really a deep, but a light reviewing process with, with, with comments. This is, it could cool. be an incentive. 
That's but now, now Sarah did put uh, the website here in the chat if you want to take note yeah, of that. Take a look. Uh, take a look. And, um, and so, you know, think about that. We are advertising it and we did, I think, you know, and, a great job. And we have, of course, a doctoral program. So if you have <laughs> interest students that's to send to us, please do it. <laughs> oh, no, that's very important, Sarah, because I was talking, well, Mark was here visiting Alex uh, last week, and I was talking to him about that because the US and the Italian system are very different, but we are a little bit of an exception because we have a four-year uh -huh. program. We pay a scholarship to the students, but we don't ask them to teach or be a research oh, wow. or teaching assistant. Wow. And we give them free accommodation and two free meal vouchers per day. So we are effectively, with all the benefit in kind, one of the highest paid PhD program in Europe, for sure. In the US, well, if you take into account that they have to spend money for their own accommodation, I don't know. I mean, they do pretty well here because they don't pay anything. We waive the fee. We, we, pay, we give them That's accommodation for, for all the four years and we give them we feed them <laughs> you know that's awesome and on top of that they get a scholarship a small scholarship per month and i don't know what they do with that probably drinking i don't know i mean there are <laughs> students here so i don't want to be nasty they're very good actually <laughs> um but yeah i mean we have about uh, between seven to ten position uh, opening every year once a year and we receive hundreds of applications but we are not well known in north america yet and i think and i think we are the best kept secret because if we start getting people from north now it's also a way to collaborate with people like yeah. you because then you can co-supervise and we also send them abroad between three to nine months in their okay. third or second year depending how far they are in their program and they can go and work with their second advisor external advisor in wherever it is in the world cool. so i think yeah we are trying to advertise our program because i i we really think that it's, it's a good one. So. Great. Yeah, I have a student in mind, actually. <laughs> Great. Next year. Now, <laughs> now we're just selected the one entering in this November. The next call is going to be out uh, February 2022 for November next. Great. Yeah, of Thank course, you. I mean, of course, no need to mention that that could be co-supervision, uh, co of course, in students. Yeah, yeah. So if you have uh, students could be interested, we'll be glad it would be fantastic to have a sort of co-supervision with, with her or with him, okay? It's a good yeah. way to build connection between Europe and North America and a very good way for a student to learn Italian if they stay here four years. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Very cool. And next time you come to do a seminar, we want you to do the whole seminar with a Scottish accent. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, when I was in Scotland and I had a similar request and it, it went well, until I got some of the like real technical, <laughs> and I was like, that, I've never said that with a Spanish voice. <laughs> but the accent, you can fake the accent, even though the oh, term is definitely, accent. definitely fake the but accent. But I, I did appreciate you said Z instead of Z. <laughs> I'm still a wee bit, still a wee bit Scottish. That's right. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Have a thank very you. nice day. And Thanks. thank you. Thank you very much for everything. Thanks for spending your evening with me, folks. I appreciate it. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.